Today I will be discussing the effects of constraint-induced movement therapy as an intervention compared to traditional occupational therapy treatment in children with cerebral palsy. I chose this topic because I was interested in the effect that this popular adult treatment commonly used in strokes and other neurological conditions would have on young children because of their different occupational needs. Constraint-induced movement therapy is an occupational therapy-based upper limb treatment for children with cerebral palsy. This therapy combines constraint of the less or the non-affected limb with a splint, bandage or harness with intensive therapy on the affected limb. This aims to increase spontaneous movement of the affected limb through forced use, increasing the child's bimanual skills and therefore improving daily function and performance. Constraint-induced movement therapy is occupational based as the end goal is to improve limb movement and control to allow for greater participation and performance in everyday occupations. Many children with cerebral palsy will learn and adapt tasks so they only have to use one hand. This means as they grow up their affected arm will be used less and less and the ability to learn new tasks with both hands will decrease. Constraint-induced movement therapy aims to combat this one-arm use and encourage bimanual use of the upper limbs and increase spontaneous use of the affected limb as they get older. I conducted a thorough search of a number of databases in order to find the most recent, relevant and high-quality evidence on this topic, including the Cochrane Database, SAGE, Medline, ScienceDirect and OTSeeker. My search returned one systematic review and two randomised control trials comparing the effect of constraint-induced movement therapy to traditional rehabilitation in children with cerebral palsy. I found out very quickly during my search that there is very limited evidence available that compares constraint-induced movement therapy to traditional occupational therapy rehabilitation. The majority of the research looks at constraint-induced movement therapy used with another invention, such as Botox injections, or compares it to another experimental intervention. It was difficult finding high level evidence trials that did not include other interventions, but I finally came across two studies conducted by the same university hospital that focused on constraint induced movement therapy versus traditional treatment. The highest level of evidence I found was a systematic review of randomised control trials that was published in 2007. This is not particularly recent but was the most relevant review available. The systematic review by Hoare et al. can be found on the Cochrane database of systematic reviews. The review evaluates the effect of constraint-induced movement therapy, modified constraint-induced movement therapy, and forced use in children with cerebral palsy. The search strategy the authors used was good. They searched high-quality databases, however maybe some more specific databases such as occupational therapy or physical therapy would have returned more results. When first reading this paper, I noted that the eligibility criteria was quite broad. However, I can now see that this was needed due to the little evidence available, with the search only returning three eligible papers anyway. One limitation of this review is that each of the three papers included used a slightly different method of constraint-induced movement therapy, making direct, direct comparisons difficult. Overall, this is a high-quality systematic review of the available literature, the main limitation being that there is not much available literature to review. The paper found there was positive evidence in support of constraint-induced movement therapy, modified constraint-induced movement therapy and forced use in the areas of motor performance and control, reaching control and everyday function. This is a high quality systematic review that makes reasonable conclusions based on the evidence presented in each of the included studies. It shows the positive effect of constraint-induced movement therapy in children with cerebral palsy. However, it does stress that there is very limited literature available in this area and that for any true conclusions to be made, more research must be done to ensure these declarations are reliable, relevant and substantiated. Sin et al. conducted a randomised control trial at Changgung Memorial Hospital in Taiwan aiming to establish the effect of constraint-induced movement therapy on children with cerebral palsy. The trial included 22 children who were already attending the rehabilitation department in the hospital. All participations had to meet strict inclusion and exclusion criteria to be included in the study. 
The children were then randomly allocated to either the intervention group, who were to receive intensive constraint-induced movement therapy, as well as weekly sessions with a physical therapist, or to the control group, who received functional unilateral and bimanual training, among other traditional rehabilitation techniques, as well as weekly sessions with a physical therapist. Both groups were also encouraged to complete set exercises at home under the supervision of their parents. This trial scored well with the Pedro scale with a rating of 8 out of 11. The main area that let it down was that neither the subjects nor the therapists were blinded, which can be a source of bias. However, with this type of intervention, it is almost impossible for them to be blinded as it's quite easy to tell which treatment you are receiving or administering. The study also failed to advise of the intention to treat in that they only treated one group and did not have a crossover design so the control group never received the intervention. Other limitations of the study include the small sample size, the results are only relevant for children with mild cerebral palsy and not all cases of cerebral palsy, they had limited tests and outcome measures on motor proficiency compared to other studies in this area and that one of the major assessments was completed by the child's parent, which could be another source of bias. This study found strong evidence supporting home-based constraint-induced movement therapy for improvement in upper limb skills and functional performance in children with cerebral palsy. The evidence also supports constraint-induced movement therapy in inducing long-term improvement in health-related quality of life for children with cerebral palsy and their families. Chen et al. in 2013 conducted a randomised control trial, also at Changgung Memorial Hospital in Taiwan, to compare the effect of constraint-induced movement therapy with traditional occupational therapy rehabilitation techniques in children with cerebral palsy. This trial was very similar to the study conducted by Sin et al., with the same strict eligibility criteria. The final 47 children were randomly allocated to either the intervention group, who were to receive constraint-induced movement therapy, or the control group, who were to receive traditional rehabilitation therapy. Both groups were also encouraged to complete set exercises at home under the supervision of their parents. Similarly to the previous randomised control trial, this paper also scored 8 out of 11 in the Pedro scale. For the same reasons, they could not blind the subjects or the therapists during the study. They also did not declare an intention to treat and only treated one group with the intervention rather than have a crossover design. I found it interesting that this study was conducted at the same research facility as the previous study but had more limitations than the first study did. These limitations included small sample size, no analysis of the amount or intensity of home practice they prescribed and no included outcomes related to everyday life of the child. They also encouraged the children to continue their original therapy programs throughout the trial, but did not assess the amount or intensity of this outside therapy. There were large effects to, in support of constraint-induced movement therapy compared to traditional rehabilitation in motor performance, motor control and some areas of reaching control. Overall, the paper found that constraint-induced movement therapy does have a positive effect on daily function in relation to movement in children with cerebral palsy. I believe that while both these studies had their limitations, they were high quality and we can take the evidence from them. Both studies show that constraint-induced movement therapy has a positive effect in children with cerebral palsy. However, I believe that much more research with larger sample sizes needs to be done into how big of an effect it does have compared to the traditional methods. The main limitation when researching constraint-induced movement therapy is the lack of available evidence. Overall, I conclude that while constraint-induced movement therapy does have an effect, much more research does need to be done in this area.